uh, Paul Whaley, right? Yes, yeah. Like yeah, the animal is what I tell people. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, everybody, we're here. Uh, we're on time. Uh, maybe just a few seconds late. Um, that's good. I have special guest Paul Whaley here from the uh, western state of Utah. That's all mm -hmm. the information we'll give on location. But he and I are both <laughs> out of the West. So there's some there's some things about being in the West that I think, um, I don't know, you just really appreciate. Oh, yes. Western culture. It's a mm -hmm. very different culture. I grew up in the upper Midwest of uh, Minnesota. And when I came out to Montana, I was like, Ooh, this is different. You know, I'd never really experienced a lot of differentness like Wisconsin's fine, North, South Dakota, Iowa. They're all kind of, you, you know, kind of generally the same. We get to Montana and Montana is its own time zone from yep. the east side to the west side. Like it's one full time zone. Very different. So mm. you want to just give the uh, audience a little bit of background of, of who you are or sure. what you want to kind of just inform yeah. them about? So, so for those who saw the previous video, the previous live stream, I submitted some photos. I'm a writer for an outdoor website covering outdoor gear, editorials, how-tos, some technique training and, and firearm-related content. And uh, yeah, Tim and I thought we'd link up and do a, a live stream here or there to cover some topics that we're both pretty familiar with. So yeah, I'm based out of Utah, initially from the East Coast of the U.S., so I grew up on the ocean, and then I moved somewhere that had no ocean, and all the lakes are toxic. So yeah. yeah. And that's what I love. And we we kind of, it was just email, so I got the email with all your um, EDC stuff on there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know how, like, it was just like natural like we just started emailing back and forth it's like hey and i was looking for somebody to, to join i love special guests i love having sure. people on with me talk about things that they're interested in and it just makes things so much more interesting so agreed uh, agreed yeah so that's well, I'm, I'm happy to contribute because watches are a relatively new thing for me yeah so i was trying to find the community that wasn't snobby but was also full of people who kind of had history and understood what, what things were you're not going to get snobby out of this channel that's for sure <laughs> snotty like maybe running nose and just like, ah, whatever. Not snotty. so anyway we have a couple of things that we have an everyday carry i didn't get to do my everyday carry mm -hmm. two and a half three weeks ago when we had uh shane from real um relative time on and uh so i'm gonna go through my everyday carry that i had at the time and it was about two weeks worth of everyday carry um there was certainly more watches involved but it's like i'm not gonna fill the picture up with watches sure okay? like sure. you get the idea i wore multiple watches but it's a variety of watches too so um, we'll go into that and then we'll get into micro brands and just like do micro brand. The, the question I have in my head, you have probably questions in yours too, but sure. are they still the deal that they once were even two years ago? Because a couple of years ago, it was like they were on fire. Like you couldn't yeah. get a better deal than out of a micro brand. So we'll talk some about that and get into that. And then we'll finish up with, because we've got, you know, spring coming on, we've got people wanting to be outdoors and things like that. And you and I both, this is another, like, there's so much about our training background <laughs> that is very similar that we both had some, uh, I would say traumatic first aid training, trauma, trauma, as in like bleeding and that kind of thing, not yeah, as emotional, yeah. but, but that kind of thing. So it can be emotional sometimes. <laughs> it almost <laughs> always is one way or the other, but, um, yeah, anyway. All right. So let's get started. We'll mm -hmm. go into the EDC. So this is the EDC that I have. Um, and this was a couple of weeks worth. And some of the things I've noticed about my EDC is I really am conscious about swapping out watches. Sure. And I'm very <laughs> almost egalitarian towards watches. Like I want everybody to have the equal amount of time. Okay. <laughs> everybody gets on the wrist once a day, then you go off. And then sometimes it's multiple watches a day because of work or whatever. Um, but you can see the variety. I, you know, I like the variety. I have a chronograph. I've got pilot watch. I've got military chronograph. Let's see. The Pierre Pauline upper left-hand corner. Mm -hmm. Kind of a dressy watch. I wore that to church. Um, and then the lower right corner, this is a sleeper. Uh, this is a Bernie, and it's a Flieger type B quartz. Titanium everything. And it's a little mm -hmm. rough on the titanium finishing. Sure. But for $50, I was like, and sapphire crystal, and yeah. I think that one's 100 meters of water resistance for sure. It's 50, but I think it's 100. I mean, that's crazy specs like, for 50 bucks. How do you get away with that? You know, like that's. <laughs> I've I've heard other channels hosts talk about this, like Mark from Long Island Watch. He's like, how do they make money? Mm -hmm. No, yeah, right. They've got. <laughs> Where be are buying... they sourcing their products? They say they've got to be buying sapphire crystals and crazy high quantities yeah. and buying quartz movements by the you know tens of thousands to get discounted rates Absolutely. or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course it's a Chinese watch too, so you know sure. they've got their their way of getting things in pretty cheap. So watch wise, 
Um, and there are a variety of bands as well. Or yeah, straps, I've noticed that. Yeah. Like leather, uh, NATO, um, metal bracelets, titanium. I, I think I've got just about everything in there. That Pierre Pretty Pauline much, is yeah. leather. It's kind of a faux leather. Like there's a, it's a laminate. So, sure, sure. But it's really, really comfortable. I love it. Now, I guess so, the one question I've got there, because yeah. this is this is not related to the topic, but kind of related. Metal bracelets in the wintertime. Obviously, yeah. you're you're in somewhere where it's very cold. I'm in yeah. somewhere where it's mostly cold. I don't like wearing metal bracelets during this time of the year, even with quick adjusts and whatnot, yeah. because I'm, I feel like I go outside and it's the bracelet's not fitting properly. I come back inside, it's fitting perfectly. Yeah. Right? So how, how yeah. do you, you feel with that? Because I, I imagine, again, you're, it's cold up there. It's colder than it is here. Yeah. How does that work for you? Do, you? do you just have to deal with it being a little bit looser? I do. And and this is where like I am on a mission with watches that I buy now, especially metal bracelet watches. Mm-hmm. I'm really looking for that on the fly adjustment. Sure, sure. And it's one of those things that I really think is it seems to be more and more common, which signals to me that sourcing that particular clasp it's is not easier. that hard to yeah, it's not that hard to do. So sure you know, looking for watches like that. So I'm more patient and waiting for some of these watches. I know on the AliExpress side, a lot of the watches, the, like the San Martins and that they're switching over to an on the fly adjustable. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think some micro brands are also switching over to on the fly adjustable. I just picked up an Islander Hemel combo. Here it is right here. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is the check six. And this review actually is coming out very soon. That was a very appealing watch when yeah. I saw it, when I saw Mark upload the video one of the few, a few weeks back. Yeah, it, it really is really well done. There's, I have one major, and it's a major issue mm. with the watch and I'll save it for the video, but sure. Um, getting to the clasp, this has the slide lock. Okay. Or glide lock where you, you put down, you, you break down, you kind of drag it and you just drag it across yeah. the side. Okay. And it's, Man, you know, and for a watch that's three hundred dollars, I mean, yep. I just, I'm like, why aren't more people doing that? Why are companies doing Trust this? Because yep. I, I'm right there with you. I, I mean, I'm see doing wristwatch check, and this will be on later. I'm wearing an Islander yeah. too. What do you got? Okay. Not on a bracelet. This is the Port Jefferson GMT. Uh, nice. Big shout out to yeah. to Mark and Ryan over at Long Island because they actually sent me yep. this to test out. Yep. Um, the bracelet doesn't have a quick on the fly uh, adjust in the clasp. Yeah. And for me, as someone who's outdoors all the time, and I'd like I love to wear a bracelet, but if I have to pull out some form right. of tool to right. size it as I'm going about. I'm going to replace it with a rubber tropic strap and just wear it on that or a NATO. But for this watch, it's a little bit classier. The tropic looks better. Yeah. So yeah, it makes <laughs> sense. I, I think it's kind of that transition time now where that micro adjust, sure. you know, dual class kind of fold over double push. Or, they, like that has kind of run its course. Yep. And now there's this source that has some of these adjustable on the fly. I think mm-hmm. my other one that I have here, I don't want to steal the show for the micro, but the notice the blackbird pilot, also mm-hmm. has on the fly adjust. So, yep. so I answer your question. Um, I don't mind it too much. Sure. I, I never really paid attention for decades how tight my um, Casio Pro Trek titanium watch was. It was titanium bracelet, titanium mm-hmm. case. And it, if it was loose, it was loose. I'd be slapping my wrist around, you know, like adjusting it and getting it back in position. You know, you kind of spin your wrist. Sure. But now I realize, hey, wait a minute. When you have a heavy watch on, you should really tighten it down. When you have a light watch, you can afford to have it looser. Right? Yeah, of so course. Yeah, that's that's part of the the learning curve in the cold weather. But I I actually I don't think it matters as sure. far as what I wear, you know, strap Fair. or bracelet. So yeah, it's funny. I've actually got an article I'm working on this comparing the different types because I found that I've gravitated towards rubber and natos, and then. A leather for dressier watches and bracelets for ones where it makes sense. But even on, you know, I, last week or two weeks ago, I showed off my little Omega here on the metal bracelet. You have to swap out links to size it. There's no micro adjust at all. Yeah. So Hey, Chris. Good to have you. Hello. Hello, Chris. Good to see you, man. Yeah. So I, um, oh, I had some, oh, do you have a, a strap style that you don't like for EDC? Uh, like the watch that you wear the most is there a strap that you will not really consider for EDC. For me, it's probably leather. Uh, I've, I've, I'm not the sweatiest fella, but in the summertime when it's 95 or hundred degrees here in Utah and I'm hiking or camping or shooting, leather doesn't do so hot. And growing up on the East coast where I was sailing or at the yeah, beach, yeah. leather never really did well for me. So I've, yeah. I like leather for dress watches where I'm probably not going to be sweating like a, like a stuck pig in my suit. Yeah. But generally speaking, I gravitate more towards NATO straps, whether they're single pass or double pass, 
yeah. or rubber, whether it's a proper FKM rubber or on a Casio G-Shock or on a regular Casio watch, the the yeah. uh, resin that they use for a lot of the straps. I, I find that I like bracelets, but it's again, it's just with with how they tend to fit with the temperature changes. I don't find myself wearing them, but yeah. leather is the one that I currently own zero leather straps. I'll put it that way. I own everything else. I even have elastic metal, though the crappy old 70s oh, things, yeah, yeah, yeah. but no leather straps for huh. me. You're an interesting man, Paul. <laughs> I also don't own a G. I'll put it that way too. So I, take with that as you will. Your disclaimer to start that whole conversation was awesome. So <laughs> be honest, what did you have? But I, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna echo the idea around leather. I mm -hmm. I'm thoughtful about wearing a leather strap. Like I'm thinking sure. to myself, am I gonna go because my job's outdoors, lawn mowing. And so yeah, I mean I just I sweat. I don't even really think about it. It's just part of the day. It's there. But I do know I'm not wearing a leather strap that day outside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the straps I really don't, oh, I hate saying this. I'm not a huge fan of, mm -hmm. I'm the least fan favorite of, <laughs> um, however you want to say this, it's the NATO strap. Okay. Yeah. And the double pass NATO strap, especially sure, sure. because it just elevates the watch further mm -hmm. off the wrist. And I just, I just, nah, that's just, I trust me. I get that. I like it close to the wrist. I didn't yeah. realize this again until I started wearing a bunch of different watches. Because when you only have one or two watches, you don't really know. Oh, you have no context. What the options are. Yeah, you yeah. don't have the yeah. options in your head. Mm -hmm. So now I know. It's like, man, you get a quartz watch and you've got you've got options on what you're mm -hmm. wearing, what you're doing, how how much you can beat on the watch. Sure, There's sure. all kinds of things. So Well, it's it's funny because, again, I, I had that Omega Seamaster, the Seamaster Pro Diver. Yeah. Uh, one of the old ones, which is why yeah. I went for it. This is so much thinner that I can pull off a thin double double pass through NATO and yeah. still only yeah. have it be 13 millimeters above the wrist. Yeah. Because just the case back to the top of the Sapphire is like 11 and a half. Right. See, but, it, but if I had a thicker watch, if it was, you know, I don't know. You I mean, you name it, right? You get something that's kind of big and, and heavier and, and just taller. Yeah, I totally get that. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. yeah. It's funny that when you get into this, you start realizing what those measurements mean. And so when I see something that's 14 millimeters, like, ooh, that is, that's tough with a Certainly. winter jacket, you know, like you just start thinking along those lines, like you've never thought of those before. So like yep. you just kind of work that jacket over the edge of your cuff, you know, and, and you start losing the finger feeling in your fingertips because everything gets constricted. Mm -hmm. in that watch. Yeah. And, and I know for me, again, obviously this is not related to the topic, but related to the bracelets or, or straps. It really is clothing dependent too. I wear a lot mm -hmm. of fleeces in the wintertime and then I've got Gore-Tex jackets I throw over and my Omega Seamaster can fit beneath both the fleece and that without feeling like I've got a rock attached to my wrist being clamped down by all of the straps to keep sure. me from getting water up the yeah. arm. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> all right, let's finish up this EDC here. I've got, let's go to the knives. I've got sure. the uh, Victorinox Huntsman there at the 12 o'clock mm -hmm. and then off to the side, I've got a Benchmade Emissary, nice. which I tell you what, the Benchmade Emissary... Have you ever handled a Benchmade emissary before? It's I've never handled open. the emissary, but I I've owned a bunch of Benchmades over the yeah. years. The assist open on that thing is so fast. <laughs> I mean, that's, <laughs> I, I can see where some states are like, well, that's kind of an automatic. I yeah, I kind of understand what you're saying, especially with this this sure. uh, knife. But so those are the the knives I really like because it's such a compact knife, and they have of a course. larger version, a smaller version. I carry the smaller version, mm -hmm. and it is it's fantastic, great oh. steel. And as, as I shared last time, I'm a huge mm. fan of the Swiss Army knives. They're so multi-useful. Even even small stuff like your your corkscrew, you'll find uses for it. You've, what is you have a what a, an ear plug in there? Yeah, that's a fire starter. And oh, fire starter. Okay. What is it? It's a fire starter. Do I have it out here? I don't have it out here. It's a fire starter. And I think it's an eyeglass eyeglasses screwdriver. Or maybe oh, okay. it's a flint steel. I, I forget which one because sure. I know one of them will fit inside. I think I have yeah. the eyeglass thing on the compact, and I think that's a flint. Okay. Um fire starter so yeah it's it's just i carry that all summer or all winter so that's my winter carry sure. and then in the summertime i'm carrying my uh, uh deluxe tinker because it has okay. a pli little tiny pliers on it i actually yeah. used it today because my fingernails are so short i was adjusting all the quartz watches back to daylight savings time <laughs> and there's a couple crowns i couldn't get my fingernail because i didn't have one like the the bernie actually was one of them that's on the mm -hmm. screen couldn't get my fingernail under there to pull the crown out so i got out my deluxe tinker just a little <laughs> plug there for the Victorinox. Hey, there you go. So you never know. Um, all right. So yeah, totally. Knives, knives are good. Two flashlights. I these are the frog I've been carrying for months, which is the mm -hmm. one on the left, uh, nine o'clock position there, and that is fantastic. I have it on the keychain right now, nice. and it's just the the proportion of this to the keys is just amazing. Yeah. As far as pocket, it doesn't take up much space, and then the silver fox. 
I still carry that one as well. And the reason I carry the silver fox is because of the magnetic base. Mm-hmm. You know, it makes it like easy the, to stick it somewhere and have it as I a spotlight. I can stick it onto a car. I can yeah. stick it onto whatever it is I need. You know, hands-free lights, something like that. Now it doesn't have. You know, if I'm wearing a ball cap, it doesn't have the, uh, the two-way it. clip on it, yeah. which is hands-free too. So, mm-hmm. but uh, See, I, I'm weird. Right. The watches are the only part of the EDC that change. Everything else stays the same. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Chris. Yeah, me and Chris, we're kind of non-NATO guys. Hey, I get uh, it. Trust me, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Got to try good quality. And I, I'm starting to go to the, I, the two-piece. The one thing I like about the two-piece straps to finish this mm-hmm. up is you can adjust them on the fly. Yeah, yeah. Like that's – I just look at that. It's like, well, if I know I'm going to have that uh, really hot temperature or sitting down cooling off, it's like I should probably go with the two-piece. Okay. Sure. So that's pretty much my everyday carry for a couple of weeks. The flashlights don't generally change that much. The watches mm-hmm. change the most. <laughs> yeah. I do swap out the knives. Like I'll carry a knife maybe for three weeks and then I'll swap out to another knife. Um, it's just that whole equal equal access yeah. in my head. Like everybody no, should that. have equal access. It's, you I try to get everybody. time on it for the review and for your own experience. I totally get that. I'm in the yeah. same boat. Every knife should have equal access to my pocket. I almost said everybody, but every knife. <laughs> I don't think you want to have everyone getting into your pockets right now. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Let's get out of this. It's starting to degrade a little bit. There's the Huntsman. Yep. Great knife. Oh, the pocket clip. I, the reason I took a picture of this is that pocket clip is awesome. What mm-hmm. What I don't like about the the Swiss Army knives in the pocket, just kind of loose, is sure. they'll go sideways at the bottom of the pocket. Mm-hmm. So you have that little clip. It hangs vertically on the side of your pocket, very easy to grab. Okay. I don't have to reach it. I just grab the clip on the edge of my pocket, like, like a knife, you know, sure. grab it, pull it out. And I've got the knife. So highly, highly recommend that for yeah, any. I, Swiss Army I knife. ended up looking at them after the uh, previous live stream. I, I found them on a couple of different websites and I haven't bought any yet, but it's like, yeah, yeah that's something that I should probably buy. Cause I, I know yeah. I'd use it. I'm going to buy a bunch of those. I think I got two or three to start with. I gave away a couple and it's like, I still need more. I've got other knives that have that split ring on there or flashlights that have the split ring sure. on there. And it just keeps everything from congregating down into the bottom of the pocket, making just a mess. So, mm-hmm. yeah. All right. Micro brands. All right. Woo. I'm going to go to the next slide because I know there's a bunch. There we go. This was out of order. So micro brands um, kind of hinted at the beginning of the, the, the live stream here. What, what micro brands, like what's the... What's the value in micro brands today, or are they the same value? Are they starting to get the Seiko uh, virus where they just kind of raise prices mm-hmm. and the quality? Or, you know, I do you have any thoughts on just generally big picture micro brands? Do you like micro brands or do you prefer it's, big brands? Just big, big picture. It depends. I, for me, price is a big part of it because in my brain, and, and if any viewers or commenters want to say it's different for them, please comment. I see it that when you get a micro brand, you're trading the history and lineage of a company for something else, right? So not that you don't get history or lineage with a micro brand, because there's some that are older, some that you can easily track back to you know, specific people, but you're not getting 150 years of watchmaking when you buy a eight-year-old or a watch from an eight-year-old micro brand, right? But what you're usually getting is more value for the movement, the materials, the finishing, things of that nature. So for me, I found that and again, this is another weirdity for Paul. I've owned zero Seiko watches in my life. Why would I buy a wow. Seiko when I can spend the same amount of money on an Islander or in a lot of cases, something like a Laurier and get better materials, better finishing, a better movement, and it's regulated a lot better, mm-hmm. right? Seiko is a historic company, and that's, I think, a lot of what you pay for, especially at the entry level, where a lot of them don't have the best movements. Not that they're bad, but you could hypothetically do better for the money if you just cared about the raw specs, right? So for me, I'm weird. If I want a historic watch company or a historic watch from a watch company, I buy secondary market where it's a lot cheaper. And I get to see the individual thing that I'm buying. Micro brands, I've spent more money on micro brands than I have for the big budget brands when it comes to new versus new. Now we're talking used. I've spent more money on used historic brands, but I I love micro brands. I think you can get a lot of value for them. Yeah. And unique designs too, that a lot of the the more established companies would kind of be afraid to do in a lot of cases. Yeah. Yeah. To me, it's all about value. Like I just think micro brands provide the consumer a more direct value. And all the reasons you stated, I'm not going to state those again, but it's just, (laughs) it's really hard not to look at a micro brand and say, well, 
Yeah, I'm going to go with a Seiko or I'm going to go with a Hamilton mm -hmm. uh, or a Citizen. I think Citizen is actually still... Their value is very good. Their value is still pretty good. Seiko yeah. is just kind of, I don't know, they... There's, you can see the companies that over the past three years, you know, the pandemic, inflation, mm -hmm. all that stuff, they've, they've upped their prices, but they haven't really upped any of the values or anything like that. And I, sure. I don't think that Citizen's immune to that, but it just doesn't seem like they had the same increase in cost to the consumer like some of these other companies have had. So uh, to me, it's about value. And I, there's a few things I look for. It's like it has to be durable. It has mm -hmm. to be reliable. Um, the movement is something I'm, I'm very uh, interested in. Certainly. What else? That, those are the big drive loom, you yeah, know, yeah. low light, no light conditions. Uh, it just extends the usability of the, of the watch. So, mm -hmm. and micro brands tend to do like how many micro brands outperform the big name brands in loom? So many. I mean, like, I, truthfully, I, <laughs> I, you know? I, I'm doing a full review of this Port Jefferson GMT. And I've been jokingly comparing it to this this Omega Seamaster that cost a whole lot more money when they were both oh, new. Yeah. Which one do you think has better loom? Which one has better case finishing? It's not the Swiss watch that cost me more than my first car did. Yeah. <laughs> right? Right. So, well, do you want funny. to talk about one of your micro brands? I'll pull sure, up the sure. Yeah, so I, I have two that I sent you photos for. One that I'm not as happy with just because the QC has not been great. But of course, as, as we've talked offline, quality mm -hmm. control is one of those things that yeah. we get to have the sample size of whatever we receive. Right. So when I bought one of the watches we'll talk about, I got one of them and my one had not great quality control, but other ones might be better. Yeah. But yeah, no, I, I love micro brands. <laughs> There's yeah. uh, for me, it's just the value equation. Plus there's a lot of interesting things there. So yeah. So the one I've got here uh, with. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree with Robbie there. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, micro brands are a lot more receptive to feedback when you, you know, you say, Hey, I want, you know, I don't know, a, a, a solid M links. They'll actually do that. Right. Right. But the watch I have here is the Momentum C Quartz 30. It's a very handsome watch. It's a watch that people really like because it was on Magnum PI. Right. And um, for the money, I, I think this is one of the less valuable ones mm -hmm. where the specs look great on paper. But then again, I receive one that has a, a fairly floppy bezel. Doesn't say, I'll get a close microphone. It sounds good, but it's, it's terrible. It feels terrible. And they did not seat the quartz movement the best to the dial. So it, the, not that I'm a stickler for it, but when you spend 300 and some odd dollars for a watch, yeah. you expect it to be a little bit better. It misses, the second hand misses every single indice on the watch. Uh, so, yeah. but, but again, if, if, let's say if the QC was better for the one I got, we're getting a, a very, very nice Jubilee style bracelet. We're getting fully milled components for everything, including the clasp. We're getting solid end links. We're getting very great case construction, a Swiss quartz movement because the original watch had a Swiss quartz movement. Right. Sapphire uh, covering over the stainless steel bezel insert. It's really nice. And I get it. It's iconic is what I like about it. A lot of watch companies are doing the 70s designs, but this one's doing a fully loomed bezel plus the fully loomed dial. Aside from, yeah. I mean, obviously the indices and the and the hands are loomed, but the, the black isn't loomed. But yeah. it's impressive. You just get some very unique stylistic things with a lot of these micro brands. And right. with this one where they used to be a very established brand back in the 70s, and they, you know, closed down, changed hands, and then now they're back. I think it gives you a very unique design that you're not seeing from other companies. Yeah. Do you think that that change in ownership for any micro brand is going to have more often than not a detrimental effect? Because I, I would think say it probably most of the time it does. Yeah. Yeah. From my understanding, Momentum stayed under the same mm -hmm. family, but obviously they moved where they were producing watches, and they still had some people at the helm, but they removed everything else. Yeah. To the point that these watches are made, they're assembled in Canada, but it's made by a company for Momentum, okay. which is how most micro brands work. It's not like, you know, Mark from Long Island watches physically assembling the watches himself, right? Right. right. This is an example. But um, yeah, that's, it's a shame because if the QC was better, this is a watch I'd wear seven days a week. Yeah. <laughs> right. But it, the second I see, oh, the second hand misses every single indice on here. Yeah. That part of my brain's like, ah, oh, well. It wears great too. I've got it on on the on a rubber tropic strap here. Yeah. Fantastic. It's how Magnum wore it, so that's how I had to wear it. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> you know, I I was this close to getting the Arnie watch. Mm -hmm. The Seiko Arnie. Because I found one that was really great deal, brand new. Sure. Really, and I was like, yeah, but I really don't like the size of the digital display. The digital yep. display is way too small. I have reading glasses, so 
I need help to begin with. And, and it's, it's already shrunken down. It's like, I am not going to go there. Sure. Um, but with Seiko and I'm kind of segueing back to Seiko, like sure. we give Seiko, I say, we generally speaking, there's a lot mm-hmm. of negative comments about Seiko and their bezels, not lining up, being mushy, all kinds of stuff. And so you turn to micro brands, you say, all right, so the micro brand, they're going to get me what I want because they sure. pay attention to the details more so than the big brands do because they're doing volume sales. Mm-hmm. I mean, Seiko sells thousands of. Oh, yeah. Uh, you see them everywhere. Yeah. So, um, but then when you have, you know, like your watch here, the momentum, it doesn't line up. It's like, what? Yeah. Well, even it's <laughs> that's why I it. came to you guys. You know, I specifically took this picture at an angle so you can't see it quite as badly. The second hand <laughs> is it mid sweep as I took the photograph. Right. So you can't yeah. see it's lined up on the indice in the picture, but that's a still photo, right? It's not video. Yeah. Right. And you can't see that the bezel, the bezel has the, the faintest little bit of back and forth play in there. Yeah, that yeah, is really yeah. it's just kind of frustrating. And I'm sure once I do the review, I'm not just going to say, "Oh, it's terrible, don't buy it." But I'm going to I'll reach out to them and say, "Hey, you know, this is an issue that happened on mine. I'm not asking for anything free, but because right. normally my microband experience besides this has been yep. nothing like that. It's been okay. I feel like I had a watch that was looked over by a person before it got put in a box and sent to me, yeah. right? And admittedly, with Islander, they sent me their their photocopy, the one that they use for all their photography. So I know it was a good one because they had to handle it before it went on their website to get pictures taken. But (laughs) it's just a bummer with this because I was so excited. Then it's like, oh, well. So I've had one lemon Mm -hmm. and it came from AliExpress, which is not unheard of. (laughs) Sure, of course. I mean, with Um, with that, you're kind of playing the gamble sometimes. But you you mentioned this before, and I I just want to add to this now that so my (laughs) – Prior to me getting into the administrative side of education, I was kind of ambivalent to statistics. I was ambivalent to kind of the whole statistical analysis, that kind of thing. And then I got into the doctoral program and and it just opened my eyes to the idea and and seeing this play out so many times on YouTube, especially a reviewer is like, I got this watch. This is not one that, uh, I mean, these watches are unreliable. It's like, nah, I'm not unreliable. The one you have is Mm -hmm. unreliable. You know, the sample size is what I'm getting at. You mentioned it before. And to just be very, I guess, fair about Mm -hmm. you have the watch in front of you that didn't work out. Is that really the largest sample size? You can generalize back to the whole, you know, category of watches that this company makes and say, Mm -hmm. well, they're all unreliable. No, you can't do that. Well, and and to the point there, you go to Momentum's website and they have reviews that are verified by people who bought the watches because Momentum's not a massive company. They're they're selling via direct from their own website or people selling the secondary market. And you can see a video where people have their watches where the second hand hits every indice and the bezel is better than mine. So I I can only chalk this up to maybe it was made Monday morning, first thing, or made Friday afternoon as they were getting ready to leave. Right. Uh, <laughs> the only thing I can imagine, because I've seen yeah. ones that certainly look better than mine. Right. But it's just a matter of, of how the specific one came to me. Yeah. If I take away the QC problems I have, this thing's awesome. I mean, it's a, it's yeah. a 300 meter water resistant quartz diver watch harkening back to the 70s. It's very thin. Again, the bracelet's a little jingly jangly jubilee, but hey, that's why they give you QD on here. So you can pull yeah. off the bracelet real quick and swap it out for something better. Right. Right. And that's I love that. Okay, so the clasp is important, sure. and the quick release, um, yeah, the quick release straps are awesome. Nice. Uh, obviously, the cameras aren't going to show the best, but nice, fully milled clasp and everything there. Admittedly, there's no yeah. on-the-fly micro adjustment, but they were hearkening back to the bracelet that they shipped with back in the '70s. Yeah, so I give know, them a pass there. Yeah, I think it's a shift that we're going through with the clasps, mm-hmm. like whatever the technology or the manufacturing is, just making these on-the-fly adjustable clasps sure. a little bit more easier to uh, to acquire. All right, so I've got one for you. And this is the Wise at Damascus. It gets a lot of has gotten a lot of attention on YouTube. I've seen many reviews lately. But this this is like to me the quintessential um I don't know, micro brand that did it right and they do it right often. And <clears throat> it's the design features, it's the materials that they use, it's um the QC on the assembly and how everything goes together. And I have it on an Artem sailcloth strap. Sure. So that's an aftermarket strap, but their strap that I got up, it comes with two straps. It was a leather one. And I, oh, I forgot what the other one was. It's not, it did not come with a bracelet because they sure. just now came out with a 904 L steel bracelet. Okay. Yeah. So I think it was like a Velcro strap or something like that. But sure. anyway, just value up and down mm-hmm. Miota 9,000 series movement. Yep. Um, and you look at that and you say, all right, so you look at some of the Seikos, you look at some of the other, you know, even like Omega, you mm-hmm. know, some of those watches. It's like, you know what, for five, 600 bucks, this watch outperforms all of them. 
and I get to keep some of my money and go get another one. <laughs> what what kind of circus am I in? Like exactly. this is awesome. You know, it's like you you win the bear that's hanging from the ceiling, and you get to go right around the corner and you get to throw you know some more softballs at those over <laughs> overly heavy bowling pins, whatever they are. I think they're magnetically attached the, to the, the glued the in bottles. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> but you get to go play that game again. So I, I just the the micro brand thing I think is um, this is to me like one of the best micro brand out there. It's not the sure. cheapest, it, it, and it's but I'm, it's I think it's one of the best mm-hmm. quality wise, feature wise. It's got some uniqueness to it um, and that kind of thing. So I and Loom, oh my goodness, mm-hmm. like I'm a huge Loom fan. I I get distracted by shiny lights, bright lights, oh, yeah. shiny things. Like it's it's not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's. So. I, I've never handled anything from Wise, but I've I've heard nothing but positivity from it. And the fact that they're doing stuff like bronze cases and things of that nature that you you'd have to yeah. buy tutor and spend three to four thousand dollars or something like that. Yeah. Generally speaking, for a lot of that similar design, and I mean even just the minor things, you got raised indices, you've got great loom. I'm sure the quality control and the fitment of everything's fantastic, and all of that that goes into it. That it's like, yeah, I agree. The value is there significantly more than watches that cost a lot more money. Do you think micro brands are um, pushing the big brands, the big box brands to do things differently? Or do the big box brands just say, you know what, you guys go do your thing. We've got our market. Do you think there's influence? There's enough push or pull? Those I don't know. I, I would I would love to say yes and to say, oh, you know, name X company they're doing better because of micro brands. But do you think Invicta cares about what they do with the Pro Diver because there are companies that, that cost the same amount of money but give you a better watch? Probably yeah. not. Probably right. not. Not not that not to poo poo that watch because it's a good watch for the money, but I I doubt it. I, I it's almost like you know, do they notice the little guys doing things a lot better for a lot less money? It's like probably not. Yeah, you know the marketing budget for some of these big companies is probably more than the entire operating budget for companies like Wise or you know yeah. <laughs> Long Island Watch, right? Yeah, and I just I, I think there's um, there seems to be such a huge influx of micro brand watches. Yes, that there has got to be an economic impact on the larger brands, especially on the consumers like myself who don't have large quantities of disposable income mm-hmm. and we're choosing to, you know, buy a wise out of Damascus rather than a Seiko or a, a higher sure. end, you know, whatever it is, a, um, a Laco or something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. um, that's, I, I just think there's gotta be a little bit of a, uh, the big brands got kicked in the shins a little Hopefully. bit <laughs> by these micro brands and they, they've got to pay attention to them at some point. Sure. Um, sure. Cause I just, there's just too many of them out there and they're doing such a, most of them are doing such a good job. And there's some out there that are just like recycling, you know, Oh yeah. They're just, movements. they're copying and yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's, and it, again, it goes back into the kind of the, the theory of the economy of watches, which is kind of boring because, you know, we, we want to wear them. We don't care about, you know, the, the movement and marketing and this and that, but you're never going to see a company like wise being sold at JC Penney or being sold at the department yeah. store. Right. It's like, it's purely online sales, which is great for us as watch nerds. But that makes it harder for someone who's just looking for a two, three, four dollar watch to buy one, right? But yep. if I see, oh, Seiko's and Tissot are being sold for two fifty at my local department store, that might change a lot of that. So they can go see it in person, go from there. I'd love to say yes, because again, the micro brands are more interesting than the big brands are. All right, Mister. <laughs> Tell us about this one. Now, this is the one you're wearing, right? This you're is wearing? the one I'm wearing. I, I have it on the, yes, I'm, I'll, I'll pull it off here. I have it on yep. the Beads of Rice bracelet that it shipped with, which is uh, nearly identical to the the previous Port Jefferson uh, watch. So I'm wearing it right now. Yep. So what this is, is, is a new watch. I actually got, was privy to a little sneak preview of this back when I reviewed the Port Jefferson standard model last year. And again, I, I, you've worked, or I mean, you've reviewed Islander stuff. Uh, they're great folks. They're very, yep. very nice. Yep. I want to, oh, yeah. I want to thank them again because, I, I'm someone that is full of honesty and integrity, as you are. I'm not trying to get freebie hand-me-outs from companies to review watches. I just want to borrow it, see how it is for a couple months, and then give it back. Yeah. Most micro brands I've, I've contacted, they just don't respond back. I got yeah. a response back from Long Island Watch within 24 hours. Yeah. Saying, yeah, we'd love to send you something. You know, They understood that it was not me asking for a freebie. I just yeah. wanted to do an honest review. Yeah. So I was lucky enough here. I'm, I'm currently testing this. This is the Port Jefferson GMT. Yeah. The previous one was the regular Port Jefferson, named after Port Jefferson, small little town on Long Island. It's a 150-meter water-resistant skin diver. This one's unique because it has the Miyota, I think, what, the 9075 true GMT movement. Right. 
So it's a proper traveler's GMT. Your GMT hand has a full 24-hour sleep uh, sweep. Here, I, I don't forget. I forget where I had it set for taking the photos, but I currently have it set for Eastern time because I got family out there, East Coast time, and then of course my local Mountain time. Yep. And it's a fantastic watch. I think it's like five fifty, which is a little bit higher up there. But when you look at the watches that use this movement, and they're usually a thousand dollars. Yeah. And then the case finishing and just the finishing yeah. of this watch. Again, I'm I'm comparing it to my Omega Seamaster that's twenty five years old. Yeah. Not maybe the, the fairest comparison, but I paid twenty three hundred dollars for this watch, and it's it's worse finished than this five hundred and fifty dollar watch is. Right. Right. So it's just yeah. fascinating to me what you can do with these micro brands. I just got an email today with a company that they're coming out with a new GMT movement. And before I clicked on the link to the web page, so you go from the email to the web page, I was like, okay, what's the cost of this watch? Let's, sure. let's guess. And I'm thinking, okay, it's a Miyota 9000. It's got these specs. It's got to be, I'm going to say seven, 800 bucks. Get to the website, $1,000. Yep. And so this, this brings me back to the micro brand question. Like, do they still provide? the same value are they sure. are they providing the same value or a good value or are they starting to get pulled into that category where guys like me are are going to aliexpress i gotta yep. say this like aliexpress is kind of like the international micro brand in a way and i know there's oh, yeah. homages and, and people call it whatever they want but you can get so but much the reality is there's the quality is so good mm -hmm. you're getting mm -hmm. seiko movements you're getting yep. you know the same kind of steel you're getting mm -hmm. good really excellent finishing on there yep and for me, it's like, well, it's even some of the micro brands, I'm starting to shy away from. A little too expensive. Else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the thing for me is that the finishing on this watch is so fantastic. Raised indices, wonderful loom. The accuracy has been regulated. Mine's running about minus four seconds a day, which is chronometer spec, which was not intentional for a $550 right. watch, right? The bezel action's great, bi-directional for setting the, the GMT function, so you can do three time zones. I'm going to see if they'll do one with a regular dive bezel, because I think that would be awesome to be able to have the dive timer and then, you know, because yes. it's still 150-meter water resistant. Yeah. And it's not super fat. It's like 13-ish 13, millimeters. But yeah. I, I get where you're coming from, where I, I won't name companies that we don't want to talk about their products, but I've seen watches using this movement where the finishing doesn't look better than this, and they're twice the price. Yeah. Right. But I, I, part of it is that Long Island Watch listens to the to the people. They, you know, they got started with doing basically SKXs that were not crappier. And then they're sort of new their own designs. And this watch here, I love the Port Jefferson. I I get this and it's mm -hmm. like, oh my God, it's even better. It's for the price, it's 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 just so fantastic. It's hard, yeah. it's hard to beat it. And again, I'm swooning over it. It's like, hey, I've got my Omega here that I spent all this yeah, money right. on. I'm like, I'm wearing this more than I'm wearing my Omega. But there's no, there's no <laughs> doubt. There's no doubt. When you when you get an Omega, I don't have an Omega, but I've had some watches that are in the higher end. I've got a Hamilton that's ex more expensive. Sure. And you can see, I mean, there there really is some things about it that's that's different. Sure. But is that really worth the money? And I'm going yep. to go back to you. You brought up the dive uh, timing bezel on a GMT. So the Laurier mm -hmm. um, Hyperion Zulu is a it Hyperion. It's the Zulu. Mm -hmm. um, they have the dive bezel. And that's why I got this. Sure. sure. Because I was actually looking at the Hyperion and uh, this one in the Hyperion and this one had the dive bezel and the Hyperion had the 24 hours. Like, no, I want the dive bezel. Yeah. I want to time something. I don't need a second 24 hour exactly. uh, dial in there. It's, it's yeah. already got a 24 hour dial. So mm -hmm. I need two of them. So I, I'm with you on that. I just wanted to share. And that. that's why when I reach back to, to Ryan over at Long Island Watch when I'm getting ready to send this watch back, because again, I'm borrowing it. They didn't give it to me. And I I'm yeah. I want I like how transparent they are. I'll say, hey, is there any possibility of a limited run where you maybe pull some bezels off the of the other Port Jeffersons and toss them on here? And just, <laughs> even if it's not even if it's not even unidirectional, that would yeah. still be useful for timing stuff, whether you're doing your Absolutely. laundry or cooking something or simple things, right? Where yeah, you will probably won't go diving with this watch, even though it's got the water resistance. But at least it's there to be a little bit more functional. But so far, my my only complaint with this is that there is no micro just in the class, which is how the previous Port Jefferson mm -hmm. was. I'm sure that if they release this this time next year, hypothetically, yeah. it would have that, right? Yeah. yeah. But otherwise, yeah. I mean, it's, it's great on rubber. It's great on NATOs. It's great on the bracelet. The bracelet's wonderfully finished, aside from the lack of that micro just. But yeah, <laughs> I I'm you see, I'm, I'm enamored with some micro brands. Other ones, there, I've had a little bit more negative experiences, not quite as much. Yep. But I do dig them. Yep. I'm looking for, where's the slide on here? Hang on one second. Eh, it's just the mishmash. I don't know if we want to go into this, but there's just, there's a whole bunch. So micro brands, there's AliExpress, there's Casio's, there's Citizen, there's, there's all kinds of stuff in here, mm -hmm. but it's just the variety that you get sure. out there, you know, and I've got, uh, is there a Seiko out there? Yeah, it is at the very top 12 o'clock. Yeah. yeah. That's the only Seiko that I have now. Um, I sold off my SP, 
SPD 85. And uh, so, yeah, I'm just like, I, I just think there's so much more out there when it comes to micro brands, certainly as far as variety, the risk taking to do something different, you know, Rolex gets knocked for doing the same thing over and again and <laughs> charging an arm and a leg and people pay for it. You know, they're oh, paying yeah. for the name or overpay and, for it. Yeah. And I'm not really willing to pay for the name. I think that's part of the mentality of micro brand owners is the name isn't that important. It's the watch itself. Like what's in it? What's it doing? Well, and, and part of it too, at least for me, I, I, not that like people are coming up to me on the street and saying, Oh, what is that watch? But when you are in your office or you're somewhere where you're around other people who might have some interest in watches, you know, you, you mm -hmm. do, they'll like to ask you about that kind of stuff. And it's, it's so much more interesting when you say, Oh, this is this unique company based out of some part of the U S or maybe, you know, Thailand, Malaysia, wherever. And you tell the little story and then you mm -hmm. share the detail and it's better than something that costs more money. Right. So I even, I, it's not micro brands, but weird old stuff. I like buying weird esoteric watches from the seventies that aren't micro brands, but they're defunct brands. So yeah. this, I have a swank here, which was a German company that was a huh. jewelry store chain from the sixties and seventies. I mean, they, they existed before that, but they didn't start making watches till the sixties and seventies when dive watches got popular. So they, they did their right. own uh, mechanical hand wine skin divers. Yeah. They have a bi-directional bezel and it's a value Swiss movement. Yep. And again, I, I like the uniqueness of not having something that's recognizable. The design right. might be timeless, but the watch itself is not like, oh, I know from across the room that you're wearing a Rolex or you're wearing a whatever, right? So I'll end my micro brand with this watch that I'm wearing right now, okay? It's a Velcro strap, okay? Oh my so gosh. Um, I do have a variety of straps, mm -hmm. and I, I like the Velcro because you can get it so perfect. Oh, yeah. Okay. But this is the Vero Backcountry. Uh, workhorse or oh, nice. workhorse back country. I forget what it is. Um, quartz movement. Uh, I think it's 150 meters of water resistance, chronograph, um, sapphire crystal. It's a little boxy. It's a little high sure. on the wrist, but I just love the simplicity of it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I remember looking at this watch and thinking to myself, man, that's, that's really simple and plain. I'm not so sure I like that. And then it's like, you know what? I'm kind of liking the simple things. Yeah. At times too. So, but again, variety. You know, and it's it's such a an interesting path to go down the micro brands because it's like it's almost a whole nother world, almost an underground world of watches. Because I've searched, you know, other YouTube channels or um, yeah, just other YouTube channels, and there's so many different brands out there. Yes, yeah, that, that you've never heard of before. And, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and they're, and they're unique too. So. Yeah. I trust me. I I totally get that. It's fun because it's like you have something that people might not know about, right? Yeah. That's more unique. Yeah. Oh yeah the the white oh, the white yeah. speedy. Did you yeah. see that? I uh, the thing that gets me. It's like <laughs> I so I don't know if the viewers or if you were familiar with the TV show Top Gear. Yeah. Right. Um. They had a skit twenty years ago where it was Jeremy Clarkson talking about how some people will look at anything and go wow, and it was showing BMW batches on piles of dog poop. And it was saying, you idiots will buy anything. I'm not saying that the white Speedmaster is dumb, but it's like, they changed the damn dial color. Right. Whippy! <laughs> like, right, right. You know, I guess it's unique and whatnot, but Omega does 800 versions of the Speedmaster every year, and right. I still ain't going to buy one. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like they're holding back. It's like, let's not do the white oh, yeah. one until 2025, and let's do a mm -hmm. fuchsia one in 2026. It's, you know, yeah, I, 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 I wake up every day and, and thank, thank the heavens that I've got no interest in Speedmasters. I'll put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> I've got no interest in chronographs as a whole for the most part, but the Speedmaster, I agree with KP commenting there. It's like people have gone crazy over it. Maybe it's, I, I'm sure that you're subscribed to some number of channels that do watch stuff. And it's like, it's like a hive mind thing. It's like Omega releases new watch. Everyone upload a video that no one's going to watch. Well, I'm on watch crunch and <laughs> <laughs> it's the same stuff. Like, and, and the, the thing that irritates me about watch crunch, I'm a, an irritation just from a user perspective. Sure. I, I'm on there. I'm going to stay on there, but mm -hmm. they have the most popular stuff at the top and it always gets the most, the most views and, and it comes up right away. And so I immediately go up and hit latest. What's the mm -hmm. latest post? Sure. Because that's sure. where the variety is. Exactly. You know? Not the top so stuff. I, it's just, it's almost a little too sheepish. I mean, mm -hmm. like the sheep following sheep. Um, when it comes down to some of these brands, it's like, come on, like there's other stuff out there. Mm -hmm. Open your mm -hmm. eyes a little bit. Well, it's to the point that you and I both have weird old glycines that nobody knows about. Yeah, right. right? And that's right. fun and cool. And I like to buy weird old vintage watches. For me, as someone who who wears an Omega and I like it, Omega's gotten zero dollars from me 
since yeah. I started buying watches. The secondary market, some vendors in Japan have gotten money from me, right. but no one from Omega has made a penny off of Paul Whaley. Yeah. So it's just, it's baffling. It's almost like free marketing for a lot of this, but that's, I mean, you've seen it. That's right. how a lot of it works. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> All right, Paul, we're going to switch gears. we got 15 yes, minutes left, and then uh, we're going to find out at the very end what, what's going on with you, what's the latest. But sure. 15 minutes, spring is here, mm -hmm. outdoor activities. Um, I'm just going to lay out a little bit here, and then I want you to, to pick this up, and I have your, your slide coming up when you start talking. But one of the things with the background that I have, which is law enforcement, um, outdoor um, first aid, provider. I forget what the actual title is, but when my wife and I went through that class mm -hmm. um, for outdoor first aid. And what, what I think people are missing when it comes down to first aid is really how fast things can go south. Oh, yes. The speed with which your body can, you know, um, shut down basically. Mm -hmm. And for a variety of reasons, a um, couple of examples. Number one, more people die of hypothermia in above freezing temperature than in below freezing temperature mm -hmm. because they dress for the weather when it's below freezing. So people, I, th I think the number is like 45 or 50 degrees. More people die in 45 degree weather from hypothermia than yep. below freezing. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Like it's the mindset of like just understanding how quickly things can change. And I've been in two situations where hypothermia happened in minutes. Sure. One of them was uh, near the top of the summit of Mount Rainier. And these two guys that did not control their body heat sweated on the inside of their coat. We stopped because we were in a blizzard. It's like a Hollywood story. I mean, it was like <laughs> if I could have had a video camera, I put my backpack. I had a backpack on, you know, and you have food mm -hmm. and water and stuff because you're a summit. And you come back down. Sure. So not a lot of stuff in there. I put the backpack down. My backpack starts going uphill. Mm -hmm. The wind was that strong. I was like, oh, this is kind of this is different. Right. Yeah. Well, anyway, these guys are standing there and within, I would say about two minutes, they are shivering uncontrollably, which yep. is pre-hypothermia. And so our guys are like, oh, we got to do this, that, it's time to go. Let's, we're not going to go to the top. It's like, oh, come on. I'm from Minnesota. It's like, this is not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> come on, we can do this. These two guys are actually from Oklahoma. Okay? Oh. <laughs> so there's a little bit of that at play too. They sure, just don't sure. have the experience. And I'm not faulting them. Like, it's part of its experience. Of course. So hypothermia is one of them. The other one is bleeding out. Yep. And one of the things I picked up on when it came down to outdoor first aid training, um, wilderness survival, or wilderness first aid is what it is, mm -hmm. um, is falling on logs, falling on sticks, getting mm -hmm. impaled by things like just weird stuff like that. Yep. It's not necessarily cutting yourself at the at the campsite. No, it's it's the environmental stuff. It's the environmental stuff. Like you, yep. you trip over and you, and you get a a log in the lung. And I'm I'm concerned about my dog doing that because I have a bird dog, um, sure. a hunting dog. And so he's jumping, he's flying through the brush and all this stuff. Like, course. how does he not get stuck in the chest mm -hmm. with a stick? And if he does, what do you do? You know, sucking chest wound. Yep. Oh, it could be bleeding really hard. It depends on where he gets hit. If it's in the groin area, and the same thing for me, if I were to fall and I got a stick in the groin, the femoral artery, you've got a, yep. about a minute before you bleed out. So mm -hmm. these are the kind of environmental things that that should have everybody's attention. Obviously, they're rare things. Sure. But the consequences are high, and mm -hmm. I think that's the that's the piece that balances it all out. If the con consequences were low, we're not talking about it. Sure, okay? sure. So anyway, I've got your first aid kit. We're, you're a really simple one, so we're just going to stick it with, with you. Yeah, yeah. So so and and part of it is that um, when it comes to the idea of an IFAC, so an individual first aid kit, um, you you kind of want to pack for everything that could happen, but also the things that are most likely to happen is one of the things, um, mm -hmm. this is not the only one that I have. I carry, and I've got it down here with me, I carry an everyday carry bag as part of my everyday carry. Obviously, it's not with me like 24-7, like on my back when I'm at the grocery store, but it's in the vehicle. If I'm going hiking, I mm -hmm. transplant certain parts of this into my hiking bag, things of that nature. Yeah. Um, but I always keep this within relative close distance, even to the point that if I'm at the gym, I'll throw in one or two components of, of an IFAC into the, the fanny pack I wear when I'm weightlifting or whatever. Um, but the big thing for me, what I've run into is that a lot of what you'd use an IFAC for is not necessarily, it could be life or death, but it's not immediate life or death. Mm -hmm. It's, I just need to keep this person around until a paramedic EMT, whatever shows up to solve the problem. Right. Cause for me, as someone who's worked white collar America, blue collar America, I've never had to be the responder unless I'm the first person there by seeing a car accident, whatever it might be. Um, what I have it in. I've alternated between different colors of, of outer container, but this is something that's inside of my bag. 
this is mm -hmm. something that's meant for me to use generally on either myself or somebody else. It's at the top. I have a mesh bag for it. It would be better if this was red, but I like the mesh because you can see right in there what's there. Right, right. So, and this is literally just a simple pencil case. This is a kid's pencil case that has a little really. Oh. It's, it has little grommets on there that you use to to clip into a three ring binder. And nice. excuse me, uh, these these are inexpensive, but also since you're carrying this a lot, a lot of the fabric stuff falls apart. So I go for something that's a little bit cheaper because I know if I destroy it, oh well, I'll replace it and get another one. As long as it's keeping the content safe and secure there. So, but when it comes to to IFAX, the thing I would say is. You, know, you can't pack enough gear to fulfill a lack of training, right? And I've got the guts of the IFAC here, but if you aren't trained to use this, what's yes. the point in packing it, yeah. right? I've heard people say, well, carry it in case, you know, you see a car accident. Maybe there's a nurse in the car behind you that could use it. It's like, well, I get that idea, but also know how to use the stuff if you're going to carry it, right? Yeah. Would you wear a watch if you couldn't tell the time? Probably not. Well, it's, it's like taking two highly... Um, unlikely events and saying, well, this unlikely event, I'm going to carry this thing that I may never use. And then I'm going to have another unlikely event where I'm going to have a nurse that follows behind me that knows how to use it. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, this is getting close to like creation. Like the world is, be is being created here. Yeah. The unlikeliness of what we're talking about is not, it's just not practical. I mean, yeah, well, I agree. Reasonably practical. Practical. Yeah. Well, and that's why it, I tell this to people, if you live in the U.S., usually you have access to uh, like first aid classes for either free or very inexpensively. Yeah, right. And on. then to yep. uh, like entry level trauma medicine stuff where you need to use a tourniquet or a compression bandage or a hemostatic agent like the quick clot or the bleed stop there. That's very cheap. It's like maybe $50 for an eight hour class because that is, it's almost like insurance companies might even pay you to go to it. You can go contact your insurance company and be like, hey, yeah. if I get first aid certified, will you pay for it? Because it's one of those things that it's a good preventative training to have access to. Yeah. And the supplies are important. But again, if you don't have any training, a tourniquet won't do you any good, right? The number right. of people I've seen with very little training who try to tourniquet this thing, you can't tourniquet your head. I've seen people yeah. try to do that before because they just didn't <laughs> know. Ah, and it sounds like a joke, but it's the truth. I've seen it, right? Oh, man. Okay, I have to ask the question before I forget because that was a, that was a great little. Sure. I loved how you were like spinning. It wasn't by your ear; it was by your neck. Yeah, yeah, I <laughs> think you're a little low there. All right, so <laughs> all right, the best training that you've had. Mm -hmm. You got like uh, I'm going to give you the two minute drill. I'm going to sure. adjust my light because I'm starting to get like, this ghost effect. But um, the best training that you've had, go like describe. Oh, and maybe it's not just the tools, but it's like the experience. Like, what's the best training so, experience that you've had? Truthfully, the the best I've had, maybe not for building skills, but for making me more aware of it. Very very simple was taking a first aid class that I did as part of doing some work with the Delaware State Police back when I lived in Delaware. So yeah. I'm initially from the East Coast, and that was something that when you have a bunch of cops around you and you've worked law enforcement, when yep. you've got people that are your friends but also they're trying to stress you out a little bit, that makes you think about it more and more. And this right. was first aid and some entry level trauma first aid. But the big thing I'll say is that um, something like a CPR class which is not tourniquets and bandages, but that's getting you into things that are more likely than sucking chest wounds and gunshot wounds and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. That was the most important thing for me because that was a an entry portal into thinking about it more, yeah. right? Understanding doing, you know, what, are, what should your compressions be like? How many beats per minute? Stuff like that, right? Knowing the skills of should you do respirations on somebody? What if they're mm -hmm. a stranger? What if you don't have access to a CPR mask, right? Right. Um, but yeah, for me, just the gateway into it, I took a first aid class when I was like 12 because I was a boy scout for a long time. And then when I started doing some more stuff where I was working with local law enforcement, it got me to look more and more into it. Yeah. So the one where it was actually like, they, they even had simulated ribs on the dummy and it was like your, your, your person doing CPR on is an 85 year old lady. What happens if you start doing compressions on an old lady? Yeah. Break yeah, you start, to, you start to hear some crunching, and the dummy oh, was yeah. crunching. So it's one of those things where we, and that yeah. was something that cost me no money. It was something that was put on by the state of Delaware to try to get young people to figure out how to do CPR yeah. and first aid and some trauma medicine, right? Go on top of that, I, I've been very happy and very, very lucky to have friends that work, uh, were in the military doing, um, you know, med medical work as combat medics and things of that nature, which has got me to think about it. And I hate to say the word tactical because that word kind of has a lot of meaning, but also no meaning, but using it in a sense where there's more stress, people yelling, things of that nature. How high do you need to have a tourniquet? What if someone's got stuff in their pockets, right? Mm -hmm. Where do you do stuff like that? So it's kind of like something that, that is very informative. But then also puts you in a semi-stressful but no uh, repercussion situation, right? The idea of training is that you're doing something where there might be repercussions, but there's nothing that's nearly as bad as if it happened in the real world, mm -hmm. right? 
And medicine's one of those things that you don't want to figure out how to use your Israeli battle bandage when someone's bleeding out on the side of the road. Right. Right. So I saw someone leave a comment saying that they carry the quick clot and the TQ. Great yep. stuff. I use the cat tourniquets. I go for the newest generation I can get. Mm -hmm. Quick clot's great. I tend to buy stuff from North American uh, Rescue, NAR. They're they're the peat maker and supplier for a lot of this stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not too hard to find the things out there. There's a lot of great YouTube things out there. My... My biggest piece of advice for anybody interested in actual first aid, like rendering life-saving first aid, is go take a course course that makes you uncomfortable. Yep. Like you have to say certain things. You have to do certain things that you've never done before. I'm not talking about like in a bad way. I'm talking about like in a productive learning way because mm -hmm. that's one of the things that you have to get over real quick in law enforcement is – you know, taking the clothes off somebody to, to search for other yep. wounds, for other yep. things like it, get over it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Get over it. Like this is, this isn't about your emotions and what you're feeling. This yep. is that kind of thing. So when you're learning some of this stuff, you need to be pushed into that uncomfortable zone. And like you said, adding some stress because yeah. if there's anything about these kind of situations is they turn instantly mm -hmm. into miniature chaos or high level chaos, yep. um, depending on, on what's going on. But uh, I think just, finding a good training course where it's hands-on and they provide you with some realism or at least get you out of your comfort zone, depending on that. And I, th I think one of the best courses that I took, I'm not advertising for anybody, but it is that wilderness first aid training because it's, it's you and the person. Okay. And that's really what it comes down to. Now, if you're in the urban setting, obviously you're calling 911. Okay. But it's still you and the person. Yeah. Yeah. Bottom line is, or people it's, it, it's what do you know that you can help with, with people in that situation? As far as equipment goes, I would say when it comes to tourniquets, there's a lot of cheap stuff out there. Yes. Avoid like the plague. Any tourniquet has a plastic windlet on it. Is it windlet or wins? It's windlet, isn't it? Windless. Windless. Mm -hmm. The plastic windless is the thing to avoid. Get the ones that are aluminum because the plastic ones can crack. And here's why, because if you've ever put a tourniquet on and you can do this to yourself, Put it on so that you can't feel your heartbeat in your wrist, okay? It is one of the more painful things that you'll ever do if you actually do it right because th what you're compressing has nerves <laughs> on it. And uh, and so we were doing that. I, we'd have to do it to ourselves because you have to do it as a copy. I do it to yourself too. But but to, to get it to the point and, and the instructor would come over and, and try to take your pulse. And if he could feel your pulse, he says, tighten it up. And mm -hmm. it's like, oh, my goodness more he says yeah i can feel your pulse <laughs> you know so now in real life you you tighten it down to where it stops the bleed but the point being is when you're in a situation going back to the chaos and doing something mm -hmm. that's uncomfortable, you have someone who's injured and you're adding more pain to it yep these are things that when it comes down to life-saving first aid stuff um you really need to be aware of and and kind of know that going in to a certain degree, but you have a great kit. I love it. Can you just kind of go over the pieces of the sure, kit? Sure. Sure. And again, this is not meant to be the most comprehensive blowout. No, it's meant to example. be the eye fact that it's a great example. Top. So going from left to right, that gray thing is an Israeli battle bandage or just a compression bandage that one's yep. six inches. So it gives you, you can get it on the chest, you can get it on an arm and that's just meant to help stop bleeding and provide compression. It's like acting like you've got another hand there to hold on to a wound. Uh, the hyphen vents or chest seals. That's if someone is receives a sucking chest wound, whether it's gunshot, something, you know, through and through penetration i've got i carry two it's hard to see with the photo but i carry two in case there's a full through and through but also there's a thing that's easy to screw up putting on people the yeah. little black bit is gloves i for me it's like if i'm working on my friends i'm not worried about infectious disease but as someone who worked infectious disease care for two and a half years i'm wearing gloves if i'm working on a stranger let me pause you for a second sure. nitrile everybody get nitrile yes. gloves yeah. because yeah, non-latex there are some uh drugs out there illicit drugs that pass through latex. So mm -hmm. nitrile is the way to go. Okay. Yep. Plus it, plus no one has nit nitrile allergies, right? If right, you, right? The worst thing could happen is someone gets shot and you're like, oh, I got a tourniquet. And then they start dying from latex infection. Yeah. Right. That, 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 you, you feel pretty bad if that were you. Uh, I have some uh, S rolled gauze. So that means it's easier okay. to come out again. There's more gauze because yep. packing wounds is a thing there. I carry two different types of hemostatic agents. I have quick clot, which is like the, the sponge style yep. and then the bleed stop, which is the powder. Now the mm -hmm. powder is worse. Generally speaking, if you're trying to pull it back out for doing surgery, but I carry the quick clot because it, that's easier to pull out. I have the powder in case it's like a hard to get to area where I can't jam the quick clot sponge in there. Yeah. 
right? And again, it's, it doesn't take up any space in the kit. The expiration date is very long. It does well with heat and cold, so I'm not too worried about it. And I'm sure people in the past have heard about um, hemostatic agents getting very, very hot on contact with skin. That still happens, but it won't give people burns anymore. Like it's World War II, mm -hmm. right? I have my tourniquet there. It's a cat generation seven. Uh, on the topic of the windlass, you actually mentioned that, you know, try to avoid plastic. A lot of the cats use plastic for one reason. They use very durable plastic. If you have to run someone through a, like an MRI machine, this gets to stay on. Mm. They, they kind of did that on purpose in case people needed to get x-rayed or MRI and things of that nature, like real quickly. Cause like there's mm. some traumatic right. stuff. So yeah, but this is an official, you know, I, I have a bunch of these gen seven cats. Uh, and then I've got trauma shears because again, if you cut people's clothes off, it's also got an oxygen tank opening, which I never had to use, but that might be one of those things where it's, it's there. But mm -hmm. again, I, I, I splurged for nice shears. They aren't the $4 at dollar general. They're the ones I bought that were from North American right. research or rescue. The fun thing too, for those who like to use Amazon and you know, please use Tim's affiliate link for this. You're, if you have an HSA through your employer, a lot of these supplies are covered under your HSA and you can buy them directly through Amazon using your HSA. Funds. Excellent point. So Excellent fun point. thing to keep in mind. I bought that quick lot using my HSA for my former employer. <laughs> That's right. That's <laughs> right. It's absolutely right. A good point on the, on the win list because yeah. that is something I remember hearing about that, but I think <clears throat> maybe qualify, I should qualify what I'm saying. The mm -hmm. cheap, uh, cat tourniquets out there, the $20 yes. ones are just not, mm -hmm. we've, we've broken them in training before. Oh, sure. So sure. Take the time, research yes. it. Yeah. hundred percent. Thanks even for with, on that one. Yeah. With cats, one thing too. So I have some older generation six ones, which are very similar, but they're a little bit different. These don't do well to UV light over time. So if, if you're someone who's running around in tactical gear or yeah. things of that nature, keep in mind that if you've got one of these as a couple of years old, and even if you've never used it before, like you've got one that you have dedicated for your training and ones that you've dedicated for actual use, you might want to retire them because they don't do the best with UV exposure. So this one's in a backpack most of the time. It's not getting a lot of sunlight exposure. This one's maybe two years old. But I've also got yeah. ones that I use just dedicated for training because they might break. And if they're going to break, mm -hmm. let's do it during training and not when I'm trying to use it on someone for real. Right on. Right so, on. Yeah. Okay. Well, hey, great kit. Um, and I think that just kind of gets people going on the right direction. But, sure, you know, sure. it's one of those things like <clears throat> the more you move, I, I have, you know, have a tourniquet in every vehicle, have a tourniquet in your backpack when you're mm -hmm. hiking. Just get multiples of these things and it's start placing insurance. them everywhere. Have a flashlight with you. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's all kinds of little yeah. EDC gets used so much. Sure. But there's some really cool like EDC stuff that you really can just minimize some of the high consequence type things that could happen to you. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. And then I guess just to supplement it, I have this out here too, which I mentioned at the start of the podcast or the, the live stream here. This orange bag, which you think it would be, this is yeah. the IFAC in here. This is actually the Boo Boo Kit. And the reason why I mentioned this is that I'm not busting out the IFAC if I stub my toe. Yeah. Right. I'm not doing it if I cut myself a little bit. It's just a little bit on the thumb. I've mm -hmm. got antiseptic agent in here for not getting an infection, bandages, more gloves in here. I've got um, neosporin. I've got uh, antihistamines for bee stings. People might have allergies. Yeah. All of the stuff that is the nice to have, but not the need to have. Right. Right. So, yeah. 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 And you'll see a lot of guys, women and men, carrying around, you know, a tourniquet. They have a little pouch in the back of their belt. And they'll have the quick cloth, they'll have the tourniquet, and maybe a, a Israeli bandage or something like that. Mm -hmm. you know, something really simple. And then yeah. you have this other kit that has a lot of stuff that you're talking about. You know, you've sure. got your aspirin, your, yeah, all that stuff. So, yeah. I, you know, think about stages. It's like concentric circles. The most, the very thing in the center is the most life threatening. That's the one that you, you know, tourniquet, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And then you move out to the um, less consequential type incidences that happen. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's why this is the this is the boo boo ouchie yeah, kit. Right? Right. I have things that are nice to have. It would suck if I didn't have them. They're great, but no one no one's dying because I forgot to pack this. Correct. Right. Yeah. Unless they unless they've got a very bad bee sting. So yeah. Well, that's true. That's yeah, true. That's actually so, a good point there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, to have that uh, EpiPen. I mean, the EpiPen, EpiPen is or some now, Benadryl. Yeah. Make them choose some now, Benadryl real quick. Did they did the company that makes epinephrine did they lower the cost because they got sued. I think that they had to because people were realizing how expensive it was to get EpiPens. Yeah. 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 And they so were I, really I mean, controlling the market. I had a lot of friends back growing up that had issues where they needed to have EpiPens on hand. So yeah. like I, I had to stab some friends in middle school and high school with EpiPens when we were out doing sports activities yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. But yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's and the nice thing about the IFAX is that you can personalize it for you, right? Absolutely. It doesn't have to be what I have here. Someone is more worried about, you know, like, I don't know if I would throw a splint into an IFAC, but if you're always hiking and a lot of yeah. up and down elevation, maybe a splint being more readily available will be more useful, right? Yeah. So, yep. 
absolutely. Well, Paul, thank you. Tweet. And thank you, we are gonna do, we're going to do this again, right? Oh, well, I, I would hope so. I would <laughs> well, hope so. Yeah. We are going to do this again. Um, <laughs> I, great topics, great conversation, yes. good comments on the uh, on the live feed here. So that's that's been good too. Awesome, awesome. And uh, so anything, just to kind of wrap it up. Anything for you that you want to share with with the viewers that are live and also the viewers that watch this post production. Uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to think of something. I was thinking about maybe us doing like a little shout out section at the end here where we could say, Hey, you know, uh, here's a channel we're watching right now that we're enjoying. That's we're yeah. not affiliated with at all. And, um, I'm going to go, go the, I'm going to go the opposite of what we had talked about. It kind of veers back into watches cause the Omega bond connection. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm a big bond nerd, very nerdy for it. I want to give a shout out to a smaller channel that I really enjoy called analyze this Mr. Bond. And the guy does very detailed analysis of the films. Yeah. He's currently working through the Roger Moore films. I think he's got about 500 subscribers at the time of us recording this. But the production value and his quality is fantastic, and more people should watch him. Yeah. So I want to give him a little shout out there. Once once we've uploaded this or the, the live stream's available in its entirety in YouTube, I'll link it in the comment section there so people can yeah. see his channel. But yeah, a little shout out to him there. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, for me, I, I think just as far as the channel goes, I'm moving into now my busy time of the year. Sure. So from basically late March through November. So I think I'm going to be doing more. It's going to be a, a more balanced, real ideal gear channel. Like that Not was the watches. intent. When I, when I first started this channel, I actually wanted to do like lawn mowing techniques because I've been doing this, this professional job for 35 years, 30 years. And there's, I'm seeing stuff on other channels. It's like, oh man, I would do it this way. So I've wanted to do more. That's what I wanted to do with this channel. And then I got into watches and then I was like, oh, I really got to do some of the things that, you know, like flashlights and knives and, sure. and some of the outdoor stuff. I did a survey and people wanted to see outdoor stuff too. So mm -hmm. I think just the update for me is going to be, there's going to be um, more of a balance sure. with the watches and everything else. I'm not going to slow down the watches necessarily. Sure. I might do some like follow-up reviews and stuff on watches okay. that I've, yeah. I've already had, but I'm going to add more things to this. Like I've got a few more flashlight things coming out because there's, there's some cool things out there. We talked about this last time. Yes. Um, you and I were just video chatting um, about flashlights and just carrying like that. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's yeah. kind of what what I'm going to get into, and uh, and uh, you'll see all that. But it's great talking with you. It's great having you on here, and Thank I you. think we're going to do this again, and we're going to have fun with another topic because sure. we're almost like cousins in a way. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. I mean, we've got By so much overlap of topics. Experiences. We got a lot of a lot of overlap and a lot of good uh, <laughs> good ideas. I mean, I. The whole uh, aluminum versus plastic. It was like, yeah, oh, yeah. It was, and that's something I had to You're be. Right. I had to be told too. It's not like I just yeah. had inherent knowledge of no. that. I had to find that out. But Good it's stuff. interesting. And yeah. some are. Some of these are actually metal impregnated to make them stronger. But a lot of them have yeah. been just full dur durable plastic. But yeah, no, well, it's, and, I, learning something new every day is part of the fun. And just add one more like cool thing. Even the uh, gauze bandages will have a, an aluminum thread through them. So if you start packing into a wound. And they go through the x-ray machines like, oh, we still have one more gauze bandage to pull out of there because yeah. we can see it in the x-ray, all right? Mm -hmm. So they, uh, there's all kinds of cool stuff on it. So check it out. Do your due diligence around first aid equipment. Go get trained. Yep. Don't take our word for it. Don't start cracking open chests. By the way, the best video ever for a satire of first aid <laughs> is the office yep. with Dwight and the, the resuscitation thing. And they're doing staying alive, staying alive. And he gets up there and he cracks open, he pulls this knife out of his, his boot, a boot knife, which is like eight inches long, stabs the, the dummy, rips it open. He's like, where's the heart? Where's the heart? <laughs> the greatest, the greatest first aid training video of all time from a satirical perspective. So it's, it's a way we'll to end CPR, it. but not good CPR. <laughs> oh man. It's a way to get a good laugh. For exactly. sure, for sure. So thank you, Paul. And uh, stick around. I'm going to chat with you after I uh, shut sure. this down. But let's, uh, let's do that. But thank you, everybody out there. Take care, um, everybody. Yeah. Have a good one. See ya.